Hello, this is Sue Watkins, the Climate Change Program Manager with the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals at Northern Arizona University. Thank you for joining the webinar. Um, this webinar series is exploring climate change impacts on tribal water resources and traditional foods, the role of traditional knowledges in climate change initiatives, and communicating about climate change. We're offering the webinars with support from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Christina, next slide. This is the last webinar in the series. The webinar will focus on communicating about climate change, including the latest trends in public opinion polling, how to frame the climate conversation, and best practices in climate engagement. This webinar is being recorded, and the presentations and webinar recording will be posted on ITEP's Climate Change Webinars webpage. Please type your questions into the question box on the right side of your screen. The presenter will answer questions following the presentation. Please mute your lines to reduce any distracting background noise. And following the webinar, you will receive an email requesting feedback. Please take a few minutes to provide comments and suggestions of topics for future webinars. Next slide. Um, here is the contact information for me and Christina Gonzalez-Maddox, who works with me in the Climate Change Program. ITEP's Climate Change Program offers trainings on climate change adaptation planning, webinars, a tribal climate change newsletter, and the Tribes and Climate Change website, and much more. We encourage you to visit ITEP's Climate Change Program website at the URL listed on this slide. And please feel free to contact us if you have any questions about ITEP. We're very pleased to have Kara Pike with us this morning for today's webinar. Um, and if we can switch to uh, her, that would be great. And while that's happening, I will introduce Kara. Kara Pike is the founder and director of the nonprofit Climate Access, a network for leaders engaging the public in the transformation to low carbon resilient communities and the Social Climate, uh, excuse me, the Social Capital Project, an environmental communication consulting firm. Her work includes creation of the Ecological Roadmap, a values-based approach to building support for environmental protection, Climate Communications Behavior Change, a guide for practitioners, and other widely used publications and toolkits. Kara regularly advises government agencies and nonprofit organizations, including the Obama administration, the state of Oregon, British Columbia's Ministry of the Environment, the City of Seattle, World Wildlife Fund, the Union of Concerned Scientists, Tides Canada, and others. She is currently serving on the Engagement and Communication Working Group of the Federal National Climate Assessment Development Advisory Committee and is on the boards of Resource Media and the Hollyhock Educational Foundation. Um, with that, I will turn it over to you, Kara. Um, let's do a quick sound check. Great. Thank you very much, Sue. How's that sound? Um, if you could speak a little louder, that would be good. OK, how's that? Better. Thank you. OK, great. Well, thank you all for joining. I was really happy to have the opportunity to <clears throat> share some of what we've been working on with climate communication, but also hear from all of you about what you're learning and what's working in your communities. So um, let me just jump in and uh, say a little bit more uh, about what we do, and then we'll jump into the presentation. So um, as Sue mentioned, we have the Social Capital Project, <clears throat> which is a consulting group. We do a mix of research, training, and strategic planning. All of these tools are available on our website. Uh, you can download them. And basically, we've been involved with <clears throat> environmental and climate communication for about the past 20 years overall, um, but the, in particular with the Social Capital Project for the last eight. Uh, I'll be speaking from some of the research work. Uh, we do uh, a lot of uh, qualitative work ourselves, but also really think it's important to look across bodies of research, not to sort of take one poll in particular. So we look at long-term trends on, on climate engagement, where the public is at, and where there might be opportunities to leverage their support. 
And one of the things that we really believe strongly is that the public has a very critical role to play in, in addressing environmental and climate issues. And, and that's going to be a real big part of the leverage for how we make the transition to low carbon resilient communities. Uh, as Sue mentioned, we also uh, run the Climate Access Network. This is a network with now 2,300 leaders from government, nonprofits, universities, who are all trying to build public support for climate policies and behavior change programs. The, uh, the network is free to join. We do screen everyone in to ensure that we're creating a high quality, safe dialogue space where people can really share best practices with one another and problem solve. So <clears throat> I hope you'll all consider joining. So today I want to cover some of the trends in public opinion and some of the best practices that are emerging in the field of uh, engagement on, on climate issues. Now a lot of times uh, people think when it comes to communication that we have to just communicate about the, the challenge that people don't know enough uh, yet or don't understand. And um, I just would like to start off by, by challenging that to some extent. When it comes to long-term trends on uh, climate uh, opinion, <clears throat> there's actually been uh, more than half of the public uh, at least having a basic uh, level of issue understanding for quite some time now. Now, there still are challenges with, with literacy, but for the most part, we have mega majorities of Americans saying, OK, this is happening. I, I believe it's happening. So um, is that you know, just arguing about is it real, the problem? Not necessarily. Uh, similarly, when it comes to concern, while not as high as basic issue understanding, still had basically majority concern, majority of Americans saying, this is a problem that I think about and I worry about. Um, similarly, uh, seeing uh, trends where uh, impacts are <clears throat> already beginning and 54% saying this, is, this issue is underway already. Uh, so that's pretty significant that people are starting to see what's going on around them. When it comes to some of those impacts, um, a lot of times the focus is on extreme weather events. That doesn't always connect back to climate, but we'll talk about in a little bit of whether or not that's even necessary to do. But when it comes to extreme weather events, you can see that there's a, a lot of concern in particular over the things that humans really need for basic survival, over our agricultural system and the electricity system. Other things are just lower on that list. Um, so we have basic issue understanding. We have a majority of Americans showing concern. One of the key challenges is that we've really seen no movement on the degree to which this issue is a priority, looking back uh, quite some time since 2009. Uh, so this is in surveys whether people choose from a list that they're given or create their own list of, of priorities. Global warming is typically on the bottom for most people and often is even on the bottom of the list when it comes to environmental concerns. One of the things that's going on, why, why are we seeing that lack of priority? We call it the not me, not here, not now problem, that the issue still seems quite distant to most Americans. So even though we've had Superstorm Sandy and a few uh, events, extreme events in the last couple of years, um, there's still a sense that when it comes to global warming, it's an issue that will impact plants and animals first, then people in other uh, countries and developing countries and eventually, uh, me personally, but I'm, I'm at the end of that. We'll talk a little bit about why that's quite a natural response to such a large scale problem. People are pretty uh, realistic. There's a recent research done by Tony Lizerowitz out of Yale uh, showing that <clears throat> people who do agree that global warming is happening, um, people aren't sort of putting it off to take for others to take care of, not thinking that uh, this is an issue that God or nature will take care of. And it's not something we can also just leave to science and technology to solve it. So people are pretty realistic that this is a challenge that needs to be tackled. One of the big, big challenges, though, and this is part of why the issue is not a priority, is that most people really do not think that we're going to get ahead of this issue. Uh, it's not so much that we don't have the ability. It's more 
that we don't have the will. And you can see there at the bottom, only 5% of Americans say that we can actually successfully address this challenge. So that's pretty daunting. And one of the biggest problems we think we have is what we call the climate efficacy gap. If anyone's familiar with the Six Americas, it's a segmentation study of the US public based on how concerned people are about climate disruption. And even amongst the alarm, the 13% who really are very concerned about the issue, only 6% feel that we're going to solve it. And again, this is not about having the ability. It's about having the, the will. So there's definitely quite a lot of fatalism going on and that efficacy gap, which is really about people not having uh, faith that government, that different institutions in our society or that all of us individually will actually be up to the task of responding. So I used to think this was a lack of hope, that this efficacy gap was because people were completely hopeless. That's not actually true. People still have a lot of hope that we will rally because we care about future generations. People do think that we're all becoming more informed and that unfortunately once these extreme weather events hit, and people feel it, that we will respond. So that there is hope. But on the other hand, that lack of faith comes from concerns that corporations only care about their own profits, that even if people are becoming more informed, they don't actually know what they can do, and that people worry about other things more. So that sort of path to the, the, the solution side is part of what's missing. We're, we've been focused so heavily on illustrating just the threat, that we haven't really filled out the part of the story that's about the pathway to something else. And that's really critical for a number of reasons. If you look to what uh, risk communication and other aspects of social science tells us about how people process a major risk and respond to it, uh, we need that part of the story filled in for a number of reasons. The first is that it's very natural for people to discount the future. So if we're just talking about climate impacts as problems 30 years out, whatnot, it's like, oh, we'll get to that later. We have other things to worry about now. So bringing the issue close and making it real is very critical. One of the things that humans are best at is filtering out complexity. There is probably no more complex an issue than climate disruption. It touches on every part of our lives. It involves science, politics, morality everything you could think of. And that's very, very hard for a lot of people to make their way through. And so it's very natural that people shut things out and don't make the issue a priority because it's being presented in a way that's so overly complex, it's hard to wrap their heads around. The other thing is that it's very natural for humans just to displace risk. That even though I may live in California, uh, it's not me that's going to be impacted by earthquakes, it's others. It's part of our basic survival mechanisms, even when we're facing an immense risk, is to push some of that off. When it comes to climate disruption, it involves both individual responses as well as collective responses through uh, policies and other programs. And what's tricky about that is when it comes to behavior change, what really is needed is a sense of individual risks. Individuals need to feel that they are going to personally become impacted in order to make a significant change. Policy support, however, depends on having a sense of societal risk, that there's something bigger that's going to impact all of it, us, that it warrants a collective response. And so when we're dealing with climate disruption, it's really both needing to present both the risk at the individual level because we need people to be part of the solution, make changes at the household level, support policy, but also that policy support comes from that larger sense of how it will impact our society as a whole. So it's needing to, to deal with both that makes this quite tricky. Uh, also, we tend to have an illusion of control, that we have much more control over situations than we do, and I think you could look at uh, situations like the extreme weather events in Boulder, Colorado, <clears throat> that even for a community that was quite proactive in planning for climate, the impacts went far beyond what anyone could anticipate. That's very hard for people to, to deal with, the fact that some of this and, and how it will impact us and the magnitude 
<clears throat> is still relatively unknown. Optimism bias, just like I mentioned with displacement of, of risk, uh, the tendency we have to think that things aren't going to be as bad as what we're hearing. Valuing certainty. This is very, very hard when it comes to where we're at in the climate conversation because so much of the public debate has been arguing over scientific certainty. And unfortunately, it's been used against action, that, that because we don't have enough certainty, we can't yet respond. This is problematic because it's tapping directly into a very natural uh, tendency that people have to prefer to reduce a small risk to zero than to try and take an overwhelming risk and only reduce it by a fraction. People prefer and value certainty that if we're going to act, we could really make a risk truly manageable or eliminate it versus just making uh, things so that the, the worst of the worst doesn't happen. So that valuing certainty has absolutely been played on in the media debate by uh, different interests who would like to see fossil fuel developments in the status quo moving ahead. Psychological denial. If you do open up your mind to the intensity of what a two to four degree temperature change means for our world, for everything that we know and understand, it is very, very emotionally painful. And even a lot of people that we work with who work on climate are actually quite depressed and sad about this problem. And so really recognizing that when you do open people up to impacts, <coughs> what comes along with that is this whole questioning. And so the more we think about our engagement processes, really factoring the emotional side of the response into play, the better. And we'll get to that in a minute. And finally, people do filter risks based on their values. Even if there are enough facts to act, if your own worldview challenges <coughs> what you're hearing, if your peer groups challenge uh, the whole notion, which is a lot of what's happening on climate change, you're not going to act. And that's because values really are what underlie our opinion and motivate uh, our behaviors, and they cluster into worldviews that often trump facts. So we'll pick up on that in a minute as well. I'd just like to point out before we move into the next section that this uh, filtering based on values is such a critical piece because we often think that if we just give people the right information, they'll make very good choices. But the work of Dan Kahane and others have illustrated that when it comes to a number of issues, but climate in particular, that often those who are most opposed to action on climate have the highest level of scientific literacy. But they're filtering that information based on their values. So we can't forget that that actually does trump just uh, processing of the facts. So let me move into recommendations. What do we do given the fact that the public more or less is with us in getting this as a challenge, they're concerned, but it's a low prior priority and we have this sense of fatalism, this efficacy gap? Well, the first is to bring impacts close to home. One of the things that our research and others has shown is that using a preparation frame is really advantageous. So this is really deliberately choosing not to respond to the scientific debate, to the manufactured debate around scientific uncertainty by arguing the science is in. We actually can avoid that trap altogether and start by focusing on the changes that people are seeing around them. People are noticing the extreme weather events. People are noticing that there are changes in the growing seasons. People are paying attention to the fact that there are extreme events happening all over the world. So we can start there and start with what people care about in their own community and build from there. The term preparedness is actually very important. We've tested uh, adaptation, we've tested uh, mitigation, uh, but talking about preparing for these changes in weather patterns, these preparing for these extreme weather events that are coming more frequently and more, more intensely actually works a lot better. It's a term that people can understand. It is an active term. It taps into the idea, going back to Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, 
just that it's prudent to be prepared. And it's actually the very notion that insurance is sold on, is that you don't wait for 100% certainty, that if enough signals are in place that there are risks, that it's prudent to start to prepare for those. Just like if there's a 60 to 70% chance of rain, not a bad idea to put your rain jacket in or your umbrella versus just ignoring it. So it's really an active mode. It starts with, what is the problem? And really articulating that the problem is about the impacts that we're seeing now are only going to get worse if we don't start to address climate disruption. Being clear that the stakes are not percentage increases in sea level rise or whatnot, but that the stakes really need to be grounded in the economic community and individual well-being factors that are at stake. We have to make this a timely thing, that this is not off into the future, that this is a why now moment, that waiting to act will only make the task more difficult and costly. And that idea that it's only going to get harder the longer we wait really does resonate well with the public. We have to ground it into, why me? Why should I care about this? Which is what people are always asking when you raise such a huge topic. How will this impact me? And we have to connect that to people's identities. If they're working on the land, if they're um, a, a fisher, if they're a farmer, if they are working in health, if they're raising a family, to connect it to what people care about. How will it impact their lives, not a generic impact? Um, what are the solutions? We can't leave out the solutions. As I said, if we're going to turn up the dial on the impacts and threat, we need to start to pave that pathway forward. So what are the solutions? And the solutions need to be on scale with the level of the threat. So just changing a light bulb is not enough. We have to talk about doing big things in our communities to respond to these trends. When we start with impacts and how to respond to them, we localize them, we connect them to people's identities, we make it clear what is at stake for people. There is an opportunity to bring in mitigation as, so reducing carbon, as an effective way to prepare for and reduce risks. So mitigation becomes one of the best preparation strategies out there because people do become aware, and we'll talk about this in a minute when we get into the engagement steps, people do become aware that this isn't a problem. We can just sort of build seawalls or increase our, you know, the height of our roads, that it's actually going to take not just responding to, but actually addressing the root. In this preparation frame, it's very, very critical to connect the dots across issues because most people don't make those connections themselves. They see something's going on with the weather. They're hearing about climate change. They're concerned about trends in their communities, but they don't necessarily tie it all together into a cohesive picture. And when we're communicating about climate, that's our job. Most people aren't immersed in this. This is not about dumbing things down at all. This is about recognizing that people have a lot of other things on their mind and that we often make the jumps from climate change, burning of fossil fuels, what you could do about it without really illustrating how these things fit together. And to really make the trends uh, as relevant to people's lives as possible. When we're talking about impacts, because of how intense the <laughs> impacts are, it's very easy to go to the apocalyptic on that. And yet that is a big turnoff for most people. Fear is one of the most demobilizing emotions we can tap. So we have to be careful that even when we're illustrating what the impacts are, we're doing it in a way that isn't completely overwhelming. Because people tend to discount the future, we can't push all the impact conversations off into the future, even though from a planning standpoint, that's often what we're working towards because a lot of the impacts are more severe, 20 to 30, et cetera, years out. But people want to know what's happening now. What is it I need to respond to now? So really needing to localize those impacts, making them relevant, and bringing in the hope. So we need the solutions, but we can't promise utopia. This is going to be a hard issue to work our way through. And the, even with benefits, there will be hardships all the way along. So we have to be not overblow the solution side either 
and make it very realistic that these are steps that are important to take now that will benefit our communities in a number of ways. So we've talked a lot about making it a values conversation, how people filter based on values, their worldviews, their peer groups. There are a number of different values <clears throat> that are in play that block engagement on climate and environmental issues. This is a, just a very short summary of some of what you would find in RE Green, the Ecological Roadmap, where we looked at uh, the American public through a values lens and clustered <coughs> them into 10 very specific worldviews. Um, this is similar to Six Americas in that it's segmentation research, but it's different in that these groups are not organized based around demographics, but rather their ecological values. So one thing to point out is that everyone really sees these issues in their own unique way. So the more that we're able to really take the time to understand our audience, understand what they care about, the better, because then you can shape things to really resonate with what they care about. Now, a lot of times people say, <clears throat> well, I can't afford, you know, I have to reach everyone. I, I have a mandate where I'm supposed to reach everyone. There's no way to reach everyone. Um, there, you know, with the current media landscape we're in, it's very, very fragmented. There are more and more ways to reach people, and it's getting harder and harder to get their attention. So we do need to pick audiences. We need to try to orient ourselves around what they care about and base the framing that we choose as well as the engagement approaches uh, to them. So, for example, the greenest Americans who have the strongest uh, ecological concerns. And this group is made up of every kind of demographic you could imagine. What they share in common is very strong ecological concern. You can talk to them about climate disruption. You could talk to them about parts per million. You can talk to them about the impact on biodiversity because they're ready to have that conversation. But as you move away from the greenest Americans, even to the idealists who have the second highest level of concern, sort of the most open worldview, you, you immediately can't use that sort of green wrapper on everything. They're more interested in do-it-yourself responses. They want to be part of the solution. They're enthusiastic about technology. They reject traditional forms of authority. Uh, they'll question uh, even an academic researcher until you could sort of show them <clears throat> where the money is coming from for that research. So they have a very, very different way of looking at things. The traditionalists, very important group. They do not like conflict. They are uh, quite conservative uh, when it comes to politics and religion. On the other hand, they really, really value stewardship and really believe in the value of social responsibility, that everyone's supposed to play by the rules. So there's a lot of opportunities to bring the climate conversation in in a way that actually relates to what people care about. Just make a final comment, because we, we don't have time to go too deep into this, but the ungreens, you'll notice. This is a small segment of the public, uh, about 5%. And it's not that they don't care about the environment. They absolutely do. Almost everyone really does. Uh, the polling numbers you see that are all very high, people care about the environment, they're, tr they're, tr they're real. Most people care. They just don't know where to go with it. Or the ideology and uh, appearance of the issue uh, is, does not fit their worldview. So the ungreens actually uh, spend a lot of time hunting, fishing, camping in the outdoors. But because they have a different political orientation to the stereotypical liberal environmentalist as an urban, you know, highly educated, white, pre-ascribing person, they reject that. So they don't hate the environment. They don't like environmentalists. So it's why we have to be very, very careful to orient things from what people care about. Let me just go back a second here. Along those lines, also extremely important to recognize issues of equity. Who is being invited to the table and at what point? This issue impacts everyone, but not everyone is as well equipped to respond to it in terms of resources and whatnot. So really thinking about uh, who is it that you are trying to speak to and how do you be as inclusive as possible to recognize that this issue does not impact everyone equally. 
I think it's also important to include the moral call to action. Uh, the more we are talking about what this issue means in terms of who we are as people, where we're going, uh, the better. This cannot be just a conversation about facts and figures because it's not just about facts and figures. We have major choices to make. And a lot of where we're seeing leadership on this issue is in the interfaith community as well as from the Native American community and in Canada, the First Nations community, really being willing to carve out that moral call to action. And you see others now following. You see political leaders following in that direction. That's a fundamental shift in the conversation that's essential. Now this is where I'm <laughs> maybe a little bit cautious in, in saying to this group, this is something I, I definitely share with others, that it's really important to integrate local and indigenous knowledge into uh, how we plan around climate, how we think about the issue, how we think about community engagement. You all have a lot to teach me about this. <clears throat> I have seen some pretty amazing examples, though, of community engagement efforts that have done this very well. In particular, I've appreciated the work of Ian Morrow. Uh, climate change in Atlantic Canada is a really interesting project where as part of doing a regional climate adaptation effort, um, they went all throughout the region and uh, did basically video recordings of people's stories of what they were seeing change and incorporated that, the local and indigenous knowledge, uh, into, the, into the planning process. Um, really uh, amazing story that I heard from Ian. He did also a lot of work in the Canadian North with Inuit communities and heard over and over from uh, elders and all across the Arctic that it looked the sky was changing, that they knew that uh, something was really going on because the sky was changing. And Ian got together uh, after hearing this in community after community, got together a team of researchers and went up and listened and, and really uh, listened to what all these different perspectives were saying and looked at whether there was scientific foundation to what was being said. And absolutely 100% there was because of the melting of the snow and ice levels in the Arctic and the impact that snow and ice has on refraction, the way that the sun appears in the sky where it sets on the horizon has fundamentally changed. So they started with local indigenous knowledge and then gained scientific understanding based on that about something that was going on that they would have never known about otherwise. So it's extremely critical to work at the local level and to incorporate different types of knowledge into responding to climate disruption. So um, just want to quickly say it's very important to also recognize where people are at in the stages of change. Uh, when it comes to climate or any other sustainability challenge, there is a readiness factor that besides people filtering and processing information based on their values, um, they're also doing that based on how ready they are to have the conversation. This is a tool that's available on the Climate Access website with a little bit more background that you can see there. It's called the 5D Steps for Sustainable Behavior Change. My colleague Bob Dobhelt put this together, basically looked at uh, behavior change, change theory from across a number of fields, and looked at what that meant for sustainability issues. So um, what happens a lot of times is that we, you know, if we're not orient orienting to where our audience is at, who are really trying to engage, thinking through what is the, the change we hope them to be part of, we will design engagement strategies that, that miss, that aren't matching where they're at. So for example, when people are at the earliest stage of behavior change, they're, they're not even woken up yet to the conversation. So if you start with talking about, well, let's, uh, here's a tool for measuring your carbon footprint, or here's an incentive for your community to adapt to climate impacts, they're not ready yet because they're not woken up to this is an issue that I'm in yet. So disinterest is the first phase and disturbances are very important and these are more emotional than factual often. Uh, where it is that, you know, experience of that direct impact or it's, it can be, 
you know, your kid comes from, from school upset about climate change and you haven't really thought about it yet, but now here someone is that you care very much struggling over it. So the disturbances can come in a number of forms, but it's basically where people are starting to experience a gap between the values that they hold and the situation that they find themselves in. Information has a role to play, awareness building is in there, but it typically fo follows that kind of first waking up. <clears throat> As I said earlier though, if you wake people up, if you sort of increase the sense of threat <clears throat> and don't give people a sense of choice, then people shut down. It's that checking out and that fatalism that we're stuck in right now. So what are the options? What are the solutions? Those absolutely need to be brought into the conversation. A lot of times though, rather than broadcasting things out just through press release and whatnot, we'll get into this in a minute, we really need to think about deeper engagement processes that allow for that emotional support, peer-to-peer -peer support, and for that uh, including concerns around equity and incorporating local and indigenous knowledge into the process. So we have to think about moving from you know, talking at people to engaging with people in dialogue through peer-based mechanisms to help bring them along through the change mechanisms. Once people uh, are woken up, they start to deliberate. That's why they need those choices. They need to know what their options are. When they get into designing, though, that's when they're deciding to, to act. That's when people are getting into developing that adaptation strategy um, for their tribal lands. Or they're starting to look at the cost of what it would be to put solar uh, on buildings. The doing is when you've decided what your plan is and you're starting to actually act in those steps. And that's when we really need to hear from other people who have been on the journey already. What have you done? What, what works? And often those uh, processes are kicked off by a commitment, a public commitment or a commitment to a group of peers, others that, uh, that you care about in order to make that desire for change stick. And I'll, I'll mention a few of these examples in a minute. When people are into the doing, that's when they need the reinforcements, the, uh, the substitutions. That's when they need the incentives for putting that solar on the roof. That's when they need the um, <clears throat> alternative ways of planning if water issues are a concern. The good news is that when people move along the stages of behavior change, it can be quite reinforcing. And by the time you get to doing, usually you've had enough positive outcomes, enough benefits coming, that you keep going and you become a champion which is the defense stage, when you start to not just do the changes in your own community, organization, households, life, but you start to be willing to share with others what were the steps that you went through, how did you get to where you are now as someone fully active on this issue. So <clears throat> let me just give some examples of change mechanisms that can be used along these different stages of change. So this is for engagement practices. So from disinterest, as I mentioned, leveraging those extreme weather events is really, really critical. But making sure the dots are being connected to climate. Um, that still isn't necessarily being done in the public conversation. Um, and you know, depending on your audience, it, it can't be done right away. If your audience doesn't want to talk about climate change, but they're willing to talk about water supply and availability, you start there. And you build over time to a conversation about the underlying driver of climate disruption. To uh, ensure that when you're thinking about leveraging those weather events, those conversation starters, uh, that people be included as well, that the impacts are not just to the natural systems, to our infrastructure, but that we really need to express are concerned for people struggling through those moments. It's also really critical, though, to mention that it's not just the big storm events where there is so much suffering around that provide um, teachable moments, because obviously that is a bit dicey to do that well. It is things like the changes in the growing seasons, noticing not getting as much rain as normal. Uh, some of those uh, more subtle but per pervasive impacts people are also noting as well. So for example, I was just in Montana 
facilitating a dialogue session with agricultural leaders who didn't really want to talk about climate change, but they did want to talk about water supply and availability and what was going on and were some of what they were seeing in their own fields something they need to be concerned about moving forward. Also, uh, very important at the, um, sorry about that, those early stages, that sometimes it's not just the, the facts, that it's the experiences. So the extreme weather events are an experience, a conversation opening, but there are other ways to bring that along. Uh, oftentimes, art and culture is a very, are very good tools to use at early stages of behavior change. So what you're seeing here now is an example of a very interesting experiential education campaign that was used to make uh, people aware of the impacts of sea level rise in Vancouver, British Columbia. So what you're seeing there is basically uh, wrappers around the bottom of uh, telephone poles that have actual sea life glued onto them, mussels and, and starfish and, and algae illustrating where sea level rise will be if climate disruption goes unchecked. And the sign at the top says global warming. It's closer than you think. And there was a, a, a website people could go to to find out more. But what, what was really effective about this is it wasn't just talking at people. It, it put an experience in a disruptive place in the middle of people's everyday lives where they're not expecting to have this experience. And because it was so interesting and non-confrontational, you could see people came up to it. They touched it. They wanted to know, what, what is this and, and what is going on? So sometimes it, it is arts and culture. It's using experience, experiences in order to make the impacts very real. Moving from uh, disinterest to deliberation, when people are starting to sort of say, what is in this for me? What really is this risk? Because this is such complex issues, visuals can really help us convey in very compelling, simple ways what is it that the challenge is, what are the trends, and what can be done about them. When people are moving from deliberating to starting to actually design what they're going to do about these impacts, very important to use scenarios to illustrate trends rather than arguing from that place of absolute uncertainty. Now, obviously, there are things that we're quite certain about, like the fact that temperatures are rising in every part of the globe, that there are more hot nights than ever, ever that changes in rainfall patterns are occurring everywhere. But when it comes down to localizing those impacts, you know, it's, the, the data is getting better. We're getting pretty clear at a regional level. Getting down to that real local level where a lot of decisions actually made is still pretty tough. So we have to make sure that we're talking about trends and different scenarios that gives people a chance to, to think through the different aspects of this issue versus being prescriptive about what it is the impacts are that they're facing and what it means for them. Risk management shows that when you can walk through people, people through a process of, of co-exploring different risk scenarios, it works a lot better than telling them exactly the risk that they're facing. As I mentioned earlier, very important when we're dealing with such complex issues, such emotional issues, that we think about going to these deeper forms of engagement, like using dialogue and peer-based outreach models. Um, one of the, the models that's out there already on climate that's quite effective was done by Union of Concerned Scientists and Viewpoint Learning. The guide, Citizen Dialogues on Sea Level Rise, is available on the Climate Access website. So you can actually look through exactly what they learn. But they set up <clears throat> dialogue sessions for citizens to explore impact trends and then work them through a set of scenarios on how to respond. So rather than telling them what the response would be, they also use sort of, here are a number of different ways that we might choose to respond and work people through that. What they found is that even for those who are still quite skeptical about climate impacts uh, or climate change, uh, it brought the, everyone into a more open place to explore it and where everyone supported at least some actions to respond because they were just prudent responses that had a number of co-benefits that made sense. 
uh, want to mention the importance, uh, actually before we move on here, I want to mention one other model, um, another really interesting campaign that was not in the climate space but in the freedom to marry area is one called Minnesotans United where they used a dialogue and conversation model in order to build support for legislation and they were very, very successful in that. Um, it used peers, they trained people in how to have a, a dialogue with people versus just speaking at them, but it was all around communicating to share values. And in that instance, they managed to have a million conversations across the state around what people thought about freedom to marry issues. So it even besides building political support, got into shaping social norms. This approach is now being tested in the climate space. We've been helping Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light test using climate dialogues in 10 different congregations in Minnesota and to see how that could shift both the social norms within the congregations as well as ladder up to policy support. So a lot of really interesting work going on in this space right now that I just wanted to mention. Just about to wrap up, though, so we have time for questions. So just a few more points here, and then we'll uh, open up the, the Q&A. So when people are starting to uh, actually engage in change, as I mentioned, the doing phase, uh, really that public commitment to change, uh, support from others is critical. We saw this with the US Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement that played a very important role in compelling cities around the country to act to address climate disruption uh, because no one wants to go it alone. People want to know that if they're going to step out and lead that they won't be harmed by it, that they'll actually be supported by others. So these <clears throat> mechanisms that are put in place to both, number one, publicly acknowledge a commitment, secondly, to do that in conjunction with peers and others who can help validate that is extremely important. Motivating the motivated and aggregating their actions, really critical that we don't just overwhelm people with individual actions, but we help convey what role they play in addressing climate change and how their actions are being added up with the actions of others to create change. This is just that Minnesotans United example I was mentioning. Besides using conversation and dialogue very well, they had a very sophisticated uh, tra database tracking system where they tracked every single conversation and they rewarded and, and reported back on the efforts of all of their different volunteers in getting the outcome uh, that they wanted on that. Another very important example of the sort of going from doing to defending where people need information from peers in order to know what to do, they need a safe place to bring up questions, how do I deal with this in adap adaptation planning? Who's ever tried uh, looking at this set of water scenarios? <clears throat> to have a place to go for that information, but also where those voices can be combined into defending the actions. And an example that comes out of the National Climate Assessment, and probably some of you are part of NCANET, I think is a, a great illustration of a leadership mechanism that was really designed in order to uh, ensure that uh, thought leaders, stakeholders, decision makers all across the country had access to impact data, but that also their stories, uh, their understanding of those impacts could be part of the rollout of the NCA. So uh, NCA Net played a really critical network-based organizing function in getting that set of, of impact reports out in a very different way than what's been done in the past. Doing and defending, because it still is hard to lead on climate, I really strongly believe we need to put more emphasis towards rewarding leaders. Really interesting example that came out of WWF was a whole new way of citizen groups partnering with government agencies. In this case, it was a race to the top to be the most prepared city to deal with climate impacts. And rather than sort of punishing and, and, and uh, constantly critiquing these leaders, what WWF did was to leverage their base of Earth Hour City participants to encourage and champion the leaders that were willing to race to the top to be the most prepared to deal with impacts. So really interesting model of how you can really 
start with the preparation frame, have a race to the top that you'll be a winner if you act on climate, and to motivate citizen groups to stand with leaders to encourage that. So with that, I'll pause. This is the way to, to get a hold of me. And, and uh, again, I hope everyone will consider joining Climate Access. But now uh, pause to make sure we have time for questions. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks a lot, Kara. Um, we do have a few um, comments and questions typed in. And um, I encourage other people to uh, put in their questions into the question box. I'll start at the top with weather droughts, states on the verge of running out of water, um, that should be a significant sign of what is to come. So that's a comment. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah you know, I think it's an excellent point. Um, what we find particularly, well, it used to be just more in, in rural, more conservative communities, although obviously in California it's going well beyond that now. But water really is an important entry point for so many communities into the climate conversation, particularly where there's resistance to talking about climate disruption very outwardly. <coughs> People care about their local water sources. Uh, watership stewardship councils are already um, quite cross-sectoral and community-based decision-making bodies that play an important role in all of this, but yeah, I think water is a key place where the concern is boiling, you know, basically hitting the ground, but it's also a really important entry point for people into the dialogue. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one, the federal government has been focusing on climate change recently, especially with Obama's EO last summer, and also the recent rule announcement by EPA on emissions. However, these agencies are inherently top-down and take top-down approaches. Often local communities are wary of the federal government because of past experiences. Yet that is often where the funding lies. You mentioned that climate change communication needs to hit folks at home and make it more relatable. So how do we translate these tools and research from the top-down federal agencies into these local communities and municipalities? I often feel there is a disconnect as well between what goes on in Washington and the real life climate on climate in the rest of the U.S. Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, I think it it starts with sort of breaking down government and federal government and sort of not not using those terms, but really starting with what your audience understands and and who they trust. Um, on climate uh, and on, as well as on a lot of issues, people do trust their local decision makers quite a lot on these topics. It's also where a lot of the activity has been at the municipal or regional level, in some cases laddering up to state, but not always, in particular since the failure of, of cap and trade legislation. So I think the, that in part is why that WWF campaign works so well, because it was focused on a level of government that people tend to trust. On the other hand, if you do break down and you sort of don't just say federal government, but you talk about particular <clears throat> parts of government, people respond to it quite differently. Um, there's quite a lot of trust for the Environmental Protection Agency, even you know outside of the Beltway, <laughs> and and um, you know it really it really depends on on the audience, but a lot of times there still is respect for different agencies and more importantly for the role that they play. So I think this is a really, really important topic because it, it, you both see that the public really wants government to act like because they know it's such an enormous problem. They know a collective response is needed, but they also feel extremely fatalistic. So as I just said, start with the level of government people trust. Um, if the federal government is going to play a particular role, try and break it down to the particular agency and the role that they play and, and focus there. Um, and, uh, and then I think, you know, the other thing that we don't do very well is to amplify the success of government programs. And we've been doing quite a lot of work. You heard from my bio 
uh, in British Columbia because of how uh, much action there's been on, on climate. And even in a jurisdiction where the government, you know, is, is one of the leading in the world, <clears throat> they've been really hesitant to talk about the results of, of their efforts because of the polarized political climate. So I think the more that we can uh, emphasize what is working, you know, we put signs along the highway when a project for improving the road has been on time on budget and we celebrate that, I think we need to start to tip more of our time and attention to the solution side and some of what is uh, going on that is exciting, um, like examples from BC having a carbon tax for five years and uh, the economy has grown, the population has grown, yet uh, emissions are, are down. Um, we don't tell those, those stories uh, enough. Um, you know, I guess just on the point of that disconnect, um, yeah, I think that disconnect is, is very, very real. Um, not just on the part of government, but on the part of environmental organizations. If they are very heavily in, you know, focused in DC, they often have a very different perspective than what's going on on the ground. I guess just with my experience, I used to work previously for Earth Justice, so worked through a number of different administrations. I think this administration has uh, more of a bottom-up approach than others I've worked with. It's, of course, not going to be adequate on an issue like this, but uh, I do think the NCA net was an important experiment um, because the whole goal with the release of the NCA this time was not just to have a report sort of off, sent off that would die, but to really create a, an ongoing dialogue around it. So that was a big question. Hopefully I've, I've given at least a few answers. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one, as for the research study you conducted on climate change, how long was this study con conducted? There's a number of different things that we've been involved with. So the um, RE Green, which is the social values research, that is a summary of six years of research it was completed in 2009. It is psychographic research, though, so it does not change as much as opinion-based research. So you're not just going in and asking people, what do you think about this? What's your response to this policy? Um, it, it was basically 900 questions getting at a whole level sort of underneath that. So it doesn't shift as much. Um, what I shared today in the presentation, though, the distillation of all those different um, trends, that's something we keep on top of all the time. So we're, we started our analysis when we did climate communication and behavior change, the guide for practitioners that incorporated another huge body of research that we were involved with. Um, so we've been tracking the trends on this issue from 1997 to current. So a lot of what I showed you was pulling from a number of different polls because what we do is we look across hundreds of them and from that identify where are their common points uh, that you see and where are there really gaps that are pointing to something else entirely. So uh, RE Green, the climate communication guide um, from basically that same 2008, 2009, but then our summaries of, of polling um, is kept up to date. Okay, thank you. Another question. Um, do you have examples of communities or organizations that have used storytelling as a way to share climate impacts at a local level? Yeah, that, that really is starting to be a very positive trend. I think that Atlantic Canada, if you just Google uh, climate change Atlantic Canada, you'll see that whole site that was put together and it was a really interesting model because basically there's like three different provinces that had worked together to um, do a bunch of climate impact research. So they had really figured out for their region what was going on with the impacts and they were starting to move into the adaptation planning process. And they were trying to think about, well, so we've got all this data, but how do we actually involve people in this and how do we get people to the table, et cetera. So rather than re releasing, I mean, the reports were all there on the website, but rather than doing that, that was that uh, example I gave earlier, 
where they brought in Ian Morrow, who's a geographer and also a filmmaker, and they went and they interviewed hundreds of people across the region and, and videotaped their stories. From that, all of those stories were actually included in back into the adaptation planning process, as well as used to communicate the story of climate impact trends in that region. So I, I think that's probably one of one of the best examples. Um, if you look look at the NCA, though, there's another <clears throat> set of videos that were quite good that were developed, I believe, by a group called the Story Project, and they captured. Um, uh, uh, stories on impacts from a number of different communities. Um, you know, there's just more and more going on in this area <clears throat> all the time. So if people keep checking back in with Climate Access, we'll have more of it. We just heard of a massive process in Boston that the city is running that has a huge front-end stakeholder engagement effort. They had their kickoff meeting just a few weeks ago, and they had booked a conference facility for 500 people and they had to turn people away. And their whole uh, orientation, as I understand it, was to start kick off the planning process with this public forum where they laid out scenarios but then opened up and heard from the community about their own experience with impacts. I'll just say one other example that's quite good. It wasn't adaptation per se but it's also on our website. There was a really great uh, community climate action toolkit out for the city of Chicago that was done by Dr. Jenny Hirsch, who used to be with the Chicago Field Museum. And in, in that context, Chicago, they did a whole bunch of research and then storytelling to inform where the public was at on input impacts and factor that into the adaptation planning process as well. So you can check our website just for that toolkit. Um, and then if, if anyone is interested in, in learning more, I could put you in touch with Dr. Hirsch. OK, great. Um, here's another question. I don't know if it's one you can answer. Are there any particular resources to be used by communities that are facing a decrease in, in precipitation that could lead to an increase in forest fire exposure? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> which is a lot, right? Um, yeah, I was just, as I said, in Montana, and that's exactly what they're dealing with. Um, I, I mean, I, I wish I could point you to, like, a very precise thing. We're working right now on a guide to communicating and engaging the public in impacts. We will have a section on drought and, and fires, so stay tuned. And Sue and Christina, I'm happy to send that your way when we're done, so you could send it out to everyone. So we will have specific guidance on that. If you look at the Climate Access website, one of the things that we try and do is really learn from what people are it's experiencing in the field. So we did um, a blog piece on <clears throat> drought response. And there's been a really interesting exchange going on between uh, um, leaders in Australia and people in California to start to exchange notes about dealing with extreme and ongoing droughts. And obviously, they've got a fire overlay there as well as soon as you get up into the mountains. Um, so <clears throat> check out the website for those items, because there are a few blog pieces. And if someone wants to be in touch with anyone in particular who's been involved with those kinds of exchanges, we're happy to facilitate that as well. Thank you. Um, the next one is um, someone sent in an, an example. Um, they say, here's an example of a place-based climate literacy service learning model that integrates Ojibwe TEK with Western science. And the um, URL is www.g-wow.org. Click on the Teacher's Corner tab to get an overview view of the GWOW model's outreach strategy and how it can it be applied to other cultures and locations. So um, thank you to the person who sent that in. Um, yeah, and if you wouldn't mind emailing that to me, we'd love to include it in Climate Access. And <clears throat> we're just also very interested in any other projects or resources that you're all aware of that you think are, are working well. We'd love to be able to 
pull that into climate access and highlight it. Okay, the next one is where may we get a copy of your PowerPoint slides and list resources cited. Um, the PowerPoint slides will be posted on ITEP's Climate Change Webinars webpage as will the recording of the webinar. Um, and then some of the resources that you, you talked about, um, Kara, I, they are on your website. I would assume where people can yeah. contact you. Yeah, and then as I said, I follow up with you when we have our guide done as well, which will pull together a bunch of these pieces. Okay, um, here's another good question. When engaging youth, how do you tell the climate change story? Mm. Yeah, it's a really good question. So <clears throat> I think one of the things that <clears throat> is really important is, is that younger Americans are more accepting of the science and um, they a lot just get it, you know, and, and I think it's where some of the really, uh, the lessons to be learned around sort of the emotional side of things and making sure that you're not just communicating from a place of despair, but you're actually operating that, uh, offering that pathway forward is so much more critical for young people. Um, and I think about it like this. I think like a lot of the traditional environmental movement narrative has been, you know, we used to have a life that was in balance with nature. And human beings came along and messed it up. Now, I'm not saying this is the Native American story at all, okay? This is more the, you know, the, the, the envir traditional environmental movement story. Um, we messed it up. <clears throat> we're horrible. We're kicked out of the garden. We're guilty. And, you know, we're going to hell in a ha hand basket. Maybe there's like a tiny chance we'll scrape it through, but maybe not. You know, and, and, and so somehow we're supposed to all rally around that call to action. And I hear this over and over again on so many environmental issues, but in particular on climate. I mean, I have two little kids, and I actually feel almost offended by this narrative because there is uncertainty still. We don't know the future. We have to be thinking about the kids and how they feel about this and feeling empowered. And I, I don't think it is right to tell anyone they have no future. So I think that's kind of number one is, you know, what is the f possible future that, you know, we can help young people tell that story, see that story, help them see some of what we might see, but not tell it all for them. But I, I think just making sure that the communications isn't apocalyptic, apocalyptic and that we're, we're not repeating to them, there's no hope, there's no, you have no future. The other thing is that, you know, when it goes for the values that <clears throat> people need in order to care about the environment or these issues, there's no set cluster. A lot of people care about these issues and come at it from very different worldviews, as I said earlier. What you can see, though, is what's missing if people aren't engaged. And it's two critical things. First is having a sense of purpose in your life, that you actually matter, that your life is worth something. And secondly, that you feel part of a community that cares about you and that you care about. And I think a lot of the fatalism that young Americans are, are feeling is those two pieces are missing. You know, they, they don't know what their life is, is supposed to be about. Is it just about buying things and, you know, being part of this machine? Um, and, you know, there's social media and whatnot, but we see, I mean, we all read the news. You see how isolated and alienated so many young people feel. So I think that climate communication with young people needs to to be about how they have a huge opportunity to be part of this amazing transformation that's already underway. They have a huge opportunity to be part of the solution to creating new ways that we're going to live our lives and that we need them desperately at the table. We need their creativity at the table and we need their lack of assumptions that we're going to do things the way we always have. I mean, that is one of the critical things that young people bring into any uh, social change moment, is that they don't assume everything needs to be the way it used to be. So I think there are some good examples out there of really, you know, like talking to kids about their opportunity and, and their future. 
<clears throat> and the very that, that they're needed at the table, that their life has a huge purpose, and that there's a place for them to come and plug in. And we have to make then those engagement opportunities real, you know, to really a include young people in social innovation problem solving. Um, so just a few thoughts. Obviously, you can tell I feel quite passionately about that and, and that we really have to stop telling kids they have no future. OK, great. Um, next question, a quick one. How do we sign up to Climate Access? Great. Well, if you just go on the Climate Access website, um, and there's a tab called Member Forums, and you click on that, and there'll be a <clears throat> short form to fill out. Um, Sue, if you give me the email or the list of who is on, that will help us uh, get everyone in faster. Because uh, if we don't know someone, if they're not sort of coming to us through something like this, we actually do take quite a few steps to ensure they are who they are, just because of how contentious this issue has been, um, how the dialogue spaces have been, you know, not that healthy. So we're really trying to create a safe space. So you just put in your, fill out the form, submit it, <clears throat> and then if we have that list of everyone who participated in this, we'll be able to expedite it and just get you all signed up. You'll get an email then uh, from us welcoming you, and then there's a whole part of the website where we offer things just to our members um, that are not public, and we do roundtables every month on different topics. <clears throat> we do in-person trainings that we invite people to, things like that, so thank you for asking that question. I really hope people will come and be part of the network. Okay. Um, so we have a few more minutes. Um, there's another question. What are your thoughts on the wearetheworldfoundation.org and earthday.org? Well, I really don't know <clears throat> enough about them to say. So um, I would love it, uh, you know, if, if whoever sent that to me wants to just shoot me a, a note and, and let me know a little bit more about it. Um, one of the things besides tracking research, we are trying to track what is going on out there in terms of different efforts and campaigns. So really welcome any other ideas for things that you think we should be highlighting. We have a campaign gallery on our website where we illustrate some of the on the ground actions that are underway. So thank you for those two websites. Okay, um, thank you. And I believe that's all of the comments and questions. So we will um, close the webinar. Um, I want to thank you, Kara, for joining us. It was a great presentation, and um, we had a lot of great questions. Um, so thank you, all the participants. Um, and as I said previously, we will be posting the presentation and the webinar recording on um, ITEP's climate change webinar webpage. Um, and with that, uh, we will say goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Yes.